I am Osmogai of the White Scars, a Khan. I have earned it. Many things changed when I gained my rank, my honor being finally ratified by my equals, my brothers. For I am a leader of men, a Khan. We had been traveling to the place of destiny, the world in peril, abundance tertius. Five jumps out, I took us off the direct route. As ever, we are hunting, checking, walking the path others will not think or dare to tread. On a star chart I looked for quiet worlds, hidden or ignored worlds, planets that could be used as a staging ground that none others might think to check. Things are rarely as they seem. So we, the sons of the great Khan, we are trained to see what others do not wish to see, do not think to look for. And my chaining, my instincts, they were right. But it is not a thing of glory or triumph for me. It is a sad discovery. For what we find, I did not wish to find. They said that the battle at Abundance Tertius would be against the Greenskins. Others too, but they were not sure who. Strategic prognostication never are. With a sinking feeling in my gut, I knew. It could not be that simple. It could not be that clean a war. For fighting against the Greenskins is grueling, their ferocity and tenacity, and equal to our own. But it is a clean thing. We fight. There is no trickery, no obfuscation, no tricks. They arrive and we fight until one side is dead, and one victorious. But what I see is not clean. It is not going to be a straight battle, a clean fight. We stopped at a planet that had been desolate and barren on all records, but we immediately registered a plethora of life signs, a cornucopia of flora, but all odd. It is the touch of an accursed one. It can be nothing but. We disembark from our storm ravens, and our tires grip the land and churn it into spray. But the sprays from our bikes are too high, too feculent, too debased. All is a sludge on this world. No trees, no ferns, no grassy plains, where clearly there should have been. So the world recovered in the last 8,000 years. Life bloomed and found a way. But then, only recently, it was all destroyed again. All turned to sludge. We do not bear our faces to the winds. We do not see the skies with our own eyes. We retain our headgear and sealed suits, as the miasma in the air flashes as lethal if we were exposed to it. It is a sign of the Lord of Flies. It is a sign of the unclean ones. It is the footprint of the Chaos God, Nurgle. He has claimed this distant and unimportant world for his own. But why? This is easily discerned. It is so that they have a world close to the action, a staging ground, being prepared for a massed movement of the followers of Nurgle. His garden on this world will give them succor. So, we visited its surface to be certain. And now we are. But I am still unsure of one thing. Are they still here? Are they massing? Are they presently on this world? Our scans have not been clear, our ship blind to the nuances, due to all of the signs blaring from this world. So we landed. So we could check. My men despise this world as much as I do. It is defiled. We mourn the distant plains that should be open and free, covered in billions of blades of grass. Its mountain tops should be covered in pristine white caps, not green and lurid slurry. So much like home. Yet what Chagoras would become if we were to surrender to evil, to chaos? This can never be. Never. Every one of my warriors will fight all the harder in the coming campaign after this. This desecration of beauty. And we will have our vengeance upon those who did this. Be it here, 
or be it on abundance tertius, they will pay. For this can be no accident, no coincidence. They are preparing their places for a protected war. This battle will not be against Greenskins alone. I know it. So many times have I dreamt of this moment, this campaign. All my life have I trained for this war. All of my life has brought me to this point. I lift my arm swiftly, and my cyber eagle takes flight, a thing of wonder. It is linked to my helm, the helm I gained when I was made a Khan. And I link with its vision. I see what it sees. The world charges away from me as I take to the skies. I ply up, and soon I see what should be white clouds bobbing in the air. They are low, they are heavy, with a light green tinge that defiles them. My bank and twist away from them. Not going beneath, but around. I see the world below me, and I want to weep. For it is all like this, debased. My vision is so wide, so expansive. I can see myself and the tiny specks of white around me on the canvas of green. Is this how he sees? Is this how Red Eagle exists? Always aloft, always aloof, always surveying. And it begins. My eyes glaze, my vision shifts. It is not my vision, nor the senses being sent to me through the ancient wisdom, antediluvian artifice coming from the Cyber Eagle. It is something else entirely. I see a different plane, a different world. It is darker. It is amid a storm. I look down on myself. I am laughing. My head bared and my fist shaking at the skies as a natural storm comes hither. It is lightning and thunder, water and wind. It is natural, and I witness my own excitement. But if I see me, then whose vision is this? I see myself down my helm, kick my ride into activity, and thunder toward the enemy lines. Clouds of another form erupt from the place I am heading toward. They buzz and flutter as they come. Some forms of huge bugs. Winged ones that drone in the skies and then fall on my men. The flies come down and attack my men. It is not reality. I see all in symbols and metaphor, but they are known to me. I have spoken for long nights with the storm seers. I know I am in a vision. All is unclear, but presented to me in images I recognize, so I might know. My men will die. Yet I laid them forward nonetheless. It is reckless. Not something I have been prone to in many, many decades now. Then I see why. If I look to my sides and above and are below, I am surrounded by small red eagles. All are now flying down behind me as I dive towards the flying things. I crash through them. My copy is doing the same. We beat them back in the air or force them to the ground, dead to our beaks and talons. The white-clad bikers then move forward unimpeded as they smash and slice the vile ones with ease. I fly down to the leader, me. I drag him from his bike and hold him aloft in my talons. We crush through the hordes of evil. He swings his sword down as I peck and use my mighty wings to destroy the enemies he misses. We forge a pathway to the heart of the evil doers. All the while I scratch at my charge all the while he struggles with my grip. And all of our struggles leads to more of the foe dead. The vision ends. I do not see where we were headed, what we were to confront at journey's end. I am looking through the eyes of my cyber eagle again. I see the enclave of scum who dwell there in the distance. We have them. I disengage my sight from the eagle as I order it to return to me, to circle over us and look further. But it is here. We have found the source of evil, and we will remove it from this world. I raise my hand and lower it. My men rev their engines, and then we are away. 
I would have loved to have ridden open plains again, without a helm, to feel the winds on my face. No matter. We ride to war. We ride to crush the enemies of the Emperor. We will avenge this world. Every tree, brush, fern and blade of grass, they will be avenged. I am awoken, brought back from the reveries of the past, forced into consciousness by my brothers, to help them, to lead them, to bring back center to their lines, not just in the ways of war, of fire and fury, blood and bone. I bring to them comfort, I bring to them pride, and I mourn for them as much as I do for myself whenever I am forced back into the world of the waking. I look up and down our lines, and I want to weep. I cannot, of course, for I am no longer truly a man anymore, encased in an amniotic sac entombed in a sarcophagus that resides at the center of a metal chassis. I was interned into a dreadnought, you see, so I could continue to serve the human race the Imperium, my Emperor. When I was asked all of those millennia ago, I answered resolutely. When they found my body broken on a battlefield, I was slipping away. I had but the strength left to respond, nothing more. I can still remember that day, even now. The cold suffusing my body, creeping up from my extremities, my legs, my arms. A cold chill of death. A face swam into my vision, blurred, darkening, almost gone. And my brother asked me, for then we respected each other, a more civilized age. He asked me, Wilt thou take the war plate of the Dreadnought? Wilt thou live on to fight the enemies of humanity? Wilt thou live on in the Emperor's name? Aye. That was my response. The one word. Aye. But if I knew then what I know now, I am not so certain I would not have answered at all. I am not sure I would not have sunk into death as a coward but never having to see what has become of our dream, our struggle, our imperium of mankind. For then, when the Emperor strode amongst us, led us, alongside his mighty sons, the Primarchs, then we fought for, not against. We fought for a galaxy safe for humanity. We fought for a dazzling dream of the future. We fought for a better tomorrow. Yet now, when I look down on our lines, I see the human wreckage that our order has become. My brothers, my fellow blood angels. Their haunted eyes are filled with the horrors of the battles they have fought, aye. Such was it with us, even then. For none can compare what is even the worst foe now against the horrors we endured and prevailed over during that first campaign, the Unification Wars. But my brethren's eyes are filled with a greater horror, a deeper tragedy. They do not fight for anything, not really. They fight against, against the enemies of humanity, against the Xenos, the traitor, the witch, and its demons. They fight against the dying of the light, against the destruction of the Imperium, against the cold trudge of inevitability. I stand amongst my brothers as they look on me in awe, and all I can do is look on them with pity. I stand amongst what they call a company, a hundred of us, 
and they think it a mighty assemblage of fighting power. Whereas I remember that once we fought as tens of thousands. Our ranks and columns are displayed that would take hours to pass. Glorious. Our army, our brotherhood, it was glorious. And we were led by the greatest of the Emperor's sons. We were led by the angel himself, Primarch Sanguinius. These poor present-day Astartes, these space marines have been forged out of fear and desolation. They are but a pale shadow of our true soul, how we once were. And these men, these brave souls around me, they have only witnessed the joy of the angel, his image, in their sarcophagi, when they sleep, when they are made into marines of the blood, echoes of memories not even theirs. Whereas I stood with him. I listened to his speeches on the dawn before battles. I witnessed his wings as he soared across the battlements of the holy palace on terror, giving strength and hope to all there, even as we stood before all of the legions of hell. He led us, inspired us, just seeing him. They will never know, not really. They will never know how we were, what we believed. And if they could, if even one of them could be shown my inner thoughts and memories, the splendor I witnessed, the dream of the Imperium that we were building every day before our very eyes, with each swing of sword, every discharge of bolt, or every drop battle or campaign. We did not do it because we could. We did not do it because we were told to. We did not do it for revenge or hatred or fear. We fought for our emperor and his son, our father, Sanguinius. Because we were fighting for something good, something worth dying for, something worth living for. We fought for the dream, a galaxy safe for humanity. A reality where all could one day be free, not only of tyranny from Xenos or warp spawn, but from ignorance and fear. We fought for a very realistic heaven on earth. And now, when I look at what we have become, what the Imperium is, I cannot fathom why my brothers fight so hard. They fight for a living hell. For that is what the Imperium is now. The antithesis of all we once strove for. It is a thing of ignorance, superstition, fear and corruption. It is not truly worth fighting for. Yet they do it. Without all the memories and visions of glory and beauty. Without the promise of a better tomorrow. Even without the promise that there will ever be an end to their war. Yet they do it. And so, for them, I am silent. I do not tell them what they missed. I do not tell them the lies of their existence, the reality of what was and how far humanity has fallen. For I know it would break them. I... Even he who sits on the throne of our chapter and protects an entire half of the Imperium. I would you even he could not survive it. The knowledge of how far we have fallen, how far we have failed, how much we have lost. It would break even Dante, I believe. So I withhold my counsel. I speak only when given a direct question. I only provide that which is required, that which is necessary. For anything more is just whispers from the past. I am a thing out of time, out of place. And I will not break my brothers with the burning fire of the knowledge I hold. These brave souls... 
How any can exist without turning to the black rage I cannot understand. For they are surrounded on all sides, fighting an eternal losing battle against a universe that has turned its back on them. And without the example of our Lord, our Father, Sanguinius, I cannot understand how they can endure it. For in this time, the tenth millennia since my death, there is no hope, there is no honor, there is no goal, there is no brilliant tomorrow. There is nothing left to fight for but the denial of death. There is only war. And that is no way to live. The fire is burning all around me, my men. Those bright and vigilant guardians whose duty it is to watch me, protect me. They are veterans to a man, though there may be only five of them. Their collected experience runs into many centuries of cold, hard, brutal warfare. They are some of our best, the most noble and glorious warriors of the entire race. Yet at this moment, Today, they are my shield. At this moment, I have been tasked with ending this conflict to win this battle. And there is only the one way to do that. To locate and exterminate with extreme prejudice, the being, the thing, that coordinates the hordes that assail us. If I can but find it, slay it, then their coordinated waves of snarling, gnashing teeth will fall apart. We have seen this before, all of us. We have faced the tyranny many times. Individually, they are a trial, a worthy foe, but one that can never be left alive, not one of them. So, I know approximately what I am to hunt down. My men around me in this burnt out building, covering me. I go to crouch. I sit down and then begin. My mind is assailed at all points. The screaming and chittering of the madness that always comes with the tyrannids. I used to almost drown in it, but not now. It is hard, but I have seen their minds. I have been guided by that paragon of power, Tigurius himself, most able and just of all of our kind under arms in the Emperor's name. Ha! Some say it is a blood angel. I care not for their vanity. No matter his achievements, he cannot match the deeds of Tigurius. He who has made contact with a very hive mind itself has thwarted it. And I have made discourse with him prepared as he outlined, for I am of the same line. The genes of the greatest Primarch run through my body, his enlightened control and vision, the root of my powers. I am a Nova Marine, and proud to be so, for there are none but the First Legion chapters that can match our glory. Not that all is glory for itself, nay, we are not egotists. But when a man knows his worth, he can spit in the eye of death itself. So, as a Nova Marine, I know my worth. But it is more than this. It is a sacred duty. Few but the original Legion chapters can have the crushing weight on them as we. For one mistake, one error, one act of cowardice or calumny, risks what my ancestors of the seed have forged over ten thousand years of war or more. I will not fail. I will not fail my sire. I will not fail my brothers. I will not fail my chapter. I will not fail my race. Despite the agony, 
the mental decibels being almost unbearable, deafening my mind's eye. They will not stop me. It begins. I pull my senses out of my body. I ascend into the skies, my point of vision like a hawk, like an eagle. I fly across the field of combat. There are so many of them, in such variety, such size, such force. I must see it. I must know where it is. I follow the lines of chatter. I follow the concentrations of mental might that emanate from the being like a wave to a shore. And I bring my vision lower, skirting across the battlefield. There. That is the central point, the being in question. It is a tyrant. Some fly, but this one does not. Good. I see my path. I note my hurdles. I will need to be quick. Yet now I look at it, but not with my eyes, not even separated as they are from the orbs within my skull. For I have another ability that is rare. It is how we are trained in the Nova Marines, how we manifest the abilities granted to us. I look at the being, as it slathers and screams and marches forward to use the flesh of its armies to break down our central defence. It knows if we fail here, if it gains ingress to the hive, it is over. Even if we culled most of them, even a handful of tyranids getting inside could rabbit into the darkness beneath, and then they would reappear in a decade or less, but without warning. I must end this today. It must die. There. For everything in the universe has a weak spot, an Achilles heel, and I see its specific weakness, as I have been trained to do. I return to my body, I open my eyes and draw my sword. A force weapon of ancient providence, a thing of master-crafted grace. Now it is time to move. I nod to my guardians, and they immediately take point, cover the flanks as they move up in standard pattern. They are my delivery system. They forge the corridor. We pick our way through the battlefield toward the thing. Ranked fire from our brothers holds them back, but this cannot last forever. We must be swift. And I can sense it. The men now break cover and fire into its guardians. Huge armored beings without eyes. They know nothing but the defense of their lord. Poetic that my guardians and its contend while we fight. For the veterans have blown me a pathway, are engaging these huge horrors to keep the lines open. And it is now I call upon the power I need, ancestral strength. I touch the warp to feed it, but it is the will and courage, endurance and power of all those who have come before me. I harness this wellspring of drive as I forge forward. It empowers my sinew, makes me move faster. The thing sees me. It raises its bone swords to defend itself. I move faster than any marine who has ever lived, the strength of my entire chapter behind me. I eat the distance between us, hurling grenades at it to misdirect and confuse it. As predicted, its swords come in at the flanks, attempting to meet in my middle and cut me in half. For even a marine cannot survive that. The bugs are learning. But I skid under bugs' blades, blow its legs up behind it. I move faster than it expected. It turns to attempt to bring me back into its field of vision. And just at that point, I wheel and thrust my sword into its side, the only real weakness this horror had. My blade parts its flesh like a fruit, and then I send the power of ages down its length. The tyrant is burnt from the inside out, charred as the focused power of my mind unloads into its torso. It is dead. The guardians of it rampage in anger, confused. Hence they are easy pickings for my brethren, the veterans. I fall backwards, my body spent, its energies all expended in this one act of but a minute. When I wake, 
I do so to a world that is being scoured. For the bugs fall apart without their central processes. And then, they are just dumb animals for the bolter to cull. We have won again. We have saved humanity from the Xenos. Constant control. My life is constant control. Never ending, never relenting. But I am a son of Sanguinius, a blood angel, a space marine. I am up to the task. More so than even my brothers, who walk the razor's edge of the red thirst, and the darker one still, the black rage. Every day we struggle with this beast inside us, that if released just once, could threaten our entire existence. It could be a moment of weakness that washes away all of the good and honor and virtue and grace we have acquired through centuries of hardship and combat. One slip from the edge, and we can topple into unending madness, carnage and blood. But sometimes I am jealous. Despite my training, despite my prestige, despite my fundamental import to the continuation of my chapter, despite all that I am, all that I do, all that I know, I am jealous. For my brothers get to fight close up as we all yearn to do, to feel the word of the chainsword, to fly high on wings of fire. But no, not for me. Never for me. For I am a tech marine, feet planted in both camps, devotion in one, duty in the other, but unified in subservience to the master of mankind, our genetic sire of sires, but also in my belief that the Emperor is the Omnissiah, the Chosen One that is the center of the Mechanicus' faith and devotion. So I tend and repair, construct and maintain, Never do I stand in the battle line. Never do I feel the heady rush of the charge. When I see the battlefield, it is usually in a supporting role, as it is today. Because we have herded them, now it is time to finish them. And, for once, my intervention is the main event. I shall save this. Not for the taking of life, not even for the crushing of the enemies of mankind. No, I shall save her being a fundamental part of our battle, of our victory, instead of just a fundamental part of our chapter's existence. The biker and land speeder elements of our strike force have been harrying the enemy mercilessly. Our battle line units forming immovable walls as ceramite that dish out punishment whenever any of them get close enough. Our assault and fire support squads close off exit points and throw them back. We are corralling them into a small valley. And, as usual, it has worked efficiently as it should. The Greenskins are actually doughty warriors, but they are also Xenos animals. They go where we lead them. They have no idea of what is in store. As they reach the last positions, our trap is about to explode into reality. I interface with a Thunderfire cannon. Its machine spirit welcomes me as a friend, almost. We are so well suited to one another. For the Thunderfire can sense my excitement. Its barrels already rotating, powering up in response. The orcs mass and prepare to break out. But this is what takes them into the exact spot. Our forces withdraw from them and they walk into it. And it is then that I introduce myself, by proxy, of course. Shrapnel exploding above them, showering their lines with hell and blood and death, as I unleash the Thunderfire Cannon. I maintain this for a full five minutes, the barrels whirring so fast that I have to be careful of overheating. But I have calculated and timed this perfectly, for I had little else to do whilst waiting. So I am consummately aware of the exact milliseconds I need to slow or stop. But it is enough. 
as the cannon is reloaded by me so swiftly. It is the last rounds that I change for the very last seconds of its ability to continue at this pace. So close to overheating. The last few dozen rounds fly into the air. Then I instantly power down the cannon and watch. For those last shells are programmed differently. They do not burst above the heads of the orcs, but burrow deep into the ground beneath them. Then they explode. The ground the orcs stand on rumbles with such force that it takes them all off their feet, throwing many in the air first and causing pandemonium. They are in disarray. And it is then that I am just that tiny bit jealous again as I look through my augers to witness my brethren marines then come down on them with fire and sword and fury. It is a sight to see. We came out of the warp at the Mandeville point, unexpectedly and quietly as always. It was only a stop-off on a dozen jump journey or more. As per standing procedures, we did our diligent duty and scanned the system briefly. The chatter was considerable. The system was in peril. Raiders. And not any raiders. Some of the most hated beings in the galaxy were running a mock on the manufacturing world of Prexes. According to the pleading Vox Hales, they had fallen on the world in the dead of night, had made its halls and corridors an abattoir, were still there even now, torturing and butchering all they could find. Going from one hive to the next, they were not merely culling our people like cattle. They were taking vast swathes of them through portals in the air, I could think of perhaps two score Xenos races it might be, but then the hails clarified. It was them. Fast and nimble, elongated limbs, horrific floating metallic monsters, creatures with no feeling of pain. It could only be the twisted raiders of the Eldar. I once had a very frustrating conversation with a Biologus and an Ordo Xenos Inquisitor. They stated that the Xenos were often as complicated in their politics as we humans. I blanched, of course, the comparison not sitting well with me at all. My bile rose. They confabulated that they believed that there were different wings of the Eldar race, some almost benign, some terrible. I asked one simple question. Just the one. What is the factor that changes what they call the almost benign Elder into the slavering scum that fall on our worlds and spirit away any that they do not torture and butcher? Silence reigned as they looked at each other dumbfounded. I nodded and barked my response. Then it doesn't matter. If you cannot tell me which is which and why, how they turn from one to the other, they are and always will be just another Xenos threat. One I will exterminate. And if I ever come across one of the blind Eldar factions, as they call them, then I will visit upon them the kind of mercy their brethren have visited on us. For as we approach the planet, we can tell that almost half of the hives have already been cleared, already been culled, all of them, billions of our kind. Every single last planetary defense force center is gone. They thought there was no one to gainsay them. But, Xenos, filth, you are in for a surprise today. With the Greenskins team in their multitudes, the slot come fast, hitting home and then holding. The Hrad migrate en masse. These ones. The Eldar of any stripe are utter cowards. They rely on speed, you see. Traps, ambushes, hit and run raids. They never stand and fight. Ever. And usually they can run rings around near anything the Imperium can put against them. The guards are slaughtered wholesale, the sisters smashed by their beasts, the scions outfoxed and assassinated, the knights ignored and moved around. But not today, Xenos. 
for they now face the sons of Lionel Johnson, the fighting first. And we know all about speed. Perhaps not to the extent of the sons of Jagatai, the White Scars, but we have our hold on it too, for amongst our number is the Raven Wing, and we shall fall on them as they fell on the populace of Praxis. As our battle barge and its escorts power towards the planet, we ready ourselves for our assault. With no Xenos fleet in orbit, we know that the scum are using their despicable webway technology to both arrive and to reap slaves from our people on the planet. So we have to hit hard and fast. Make sure we punish as many of them before they scuttle back into their dimension. And so we do. Our fleet reaches high orbit on the dark side of the planet where they are enjoying themselves. And within two minutes, just two, Every single one of our Raven Wing is already falling towards the surface. Their land speeders, anti-gravity plates not enough for true flight, as if they only turn on when near a large structure or planet. Our speeders will never hit the ground. But at the present we fall nose down and as fast as we can, hitting the thrusters as soon as we pass the highest altitudes and the burn is suddenly worth it. And we can instantly see them. With our augmented auspex arrays on the Talon Master's speeder, we can see them. We split into four wings, all preparing to hit from one of the cardinal points of the hive, the one the Eldar scum are tearing asunder as we approach. Three groups hug the ground so low that none inside the hive could spot them. The one tendril of our thrust that comes in high is covered by the might of an icon. A dark inky pool obfuscates us from the foe as we are under the aegis of the Dark Shroud. We can see the small silhouettes of their bird-like killers on bikes circling and then swooping down to slay our kind. No longer. We hit. The Tunnel Master has detected damn well all of them and given us our vectors. The upper spires are the target of our storm speed as hail strikes, their fusillades of fire filling the skies. The bird-winged monstrosities try to evade, using their speed and agility, but it is to no avail. Perhaps. If we only had land speeders, vengeances and shrouds, it would be different. But we have more now. So much more. Our primary brethren unleash their firepower and the difference is tearing. Fragstorm grenade launchers are used to create flak that forces the bird-like scum into alleyways in the air. They are eyes and supple, but practically unarmored. Thus fragstorm grenades would rip their wings to pieces and send them to the ground. But as they evade the explosions, they are then gunned down by the onslaught Gatling cannons and Iron Hell stubbers. Unprepared as they are, herded by our expertly coordinated forces, these Eldar scum start falling out of the skies as plentifully as the shell casings we eject. It is a beautiful sight to see. In the mid tiers, there are Eldar now shooting out at us with their vile weapons. Fewer hit, fewer still actually harmed as most of it is small arms fire. Reeking patches of liquid strike our vessels as a degenerate elder attempt to strike the pilots and gunners but fail. A bark of blackness streaks into the air at points and damages or brings down one of our craft, but these are few. We are the most skilled aerial combatants in the Astartes. We know how to drink, how to barrel roll and evade. These Xenos are used to fighting people who move in slow motion compared to them. Ha! We are a star. We are on a par. We are fast. And they are not prepared. Our storm speeder hammer strikes and vengeances take to tearing apart the spires that house these knots of Xenos. When one flies in, they unleash their crack storm grenades to dazzle and maim, then fire hammer strike missiles at a distance, finally whipping in and eliminating entire floors of the spires with their melted destroyers. The small arms fire coming from the spires is all but silenced as our land speeder storms then land and disembark scouts to hunt the remains in the dark. And finally, on the ground, where their floating monstrosities abound, our storm speeder thunder strikes take their toll. Storm fury missiles, Lyre's talons and Icarus pods are fired down with rage. When a second pass occurs, supported by the Vengeance models with their plasma storm batteries, there is little left. Elder jet bikes are now being chased across the skies, annihilated as they fall into well-coordinated traps of ours. 
and their avenues of escape they find covered by well-positioned speeders. And within only an hour, smoke billowing, the grounds now clustered with enemy dead to match those they had slain. The battle is over. What remains of the vermin are hunted down via our raw specs, or are known to have removed themselves from the world via their gates. They will not come back here. The Eldar are cowards. And in the Emperor's name, one day I hope to be there. To be there to watch the light die in the eyes of the last one of them. For in all the galaxy, there are none as hated as the Eldar. Storvim Gyros barely returned to consciousness. His head rang and felt like it would pull apart, so heavy was the concussion he was presently enduring. His eyes were mostly closed, swollen and discolored, he would wager. But he did not open them yet. Not fully. Well, as fully as he could under the circumstances. Not yet. As the sounds of the sprawling camp assailed his senses and cut through the tinnitus echoing around his skull, yet there were no smells. Despite his blood congealing in seconds, as did all Astartes due to their enhanced physiology, he could not smell. His nose was broken in so many places, it must have looked like a miniature flesh accordion stapled to the plane of his face. He took stock. His arms were tied firmly behind his back, his legs tethered to the ground by a more ingenuitive method. From the pain, it would seem that they had driven meter-long spikes through his armor, through his feet, and into the ground itself. The marine shifted a millimeter to check the situation. He could feel the hot metal through his entire foot. It was confirmed. He was going nowhere. Good. They had him exactly where he wanted them to. Storvin Gyros ran his swollen tongue around the cavity of his mouth, firstly checking he still had a tongue, but also to see if he would be able to speak at all. Calmly, he found the missing teeth, but also the burn marks on the inside of his mouth, as they had cauterized his glands there. No acid spit today. They knew their business, is what they must have thought. The Marine would have chortled, even through the pain, had his mask not been so very important. His jaw was still intact and his vocal cords still present. He could make noise if he so chose. His power armor was still mostly on him. They had not the wit or skill to be able to unlatch it and remove it. Good. Storvim sat there in silence, eyes still open only a tiny slit as he took stock. He mainly saw light and shadow. A tent. From the glares as wind swept open the portal every now and again, and light cascaded into the tent from time to time. Within the shadows, he could make out two figures only. Perhaps there were more behind him, to his side, but he could only make out the two to his four. They sat in silence but he could not make out if they were resting, sleeping, or watching. He lurched his head in what would appear to be an unconscious, natural way, a lurch or fit between terrifying dreams, so that he could take in more angles. None moved. None reacted. Ah. It seemed his napping period had contained these movements already. And there they were, as he scanned around surreptitiously, his bolter, his pistol, combat knife, and his helmet. Good. But the Marine could not make out much more of his surroundings due to the lack of light. So he waited, patiently, through the pain, through the boredom, through the inactivity. Many think that waiting is doing nothing. Storvim knew that this was not the case. Sometimes the most important part of any operation, any strike, was the waiting. And it was not a passive thing. He was preparing. The flesh was weak, but Storvim Gyros was not. He would be ready. 
Eventually, the tent flap was hauled fully back and in process a new player in this, his final drama. A few large and ugly brutish men appeared and seemed to be flanking a tall and willowy being. Being was the only word that Storvin could use to describe him. He was not human, not really, and certainly no more so than the marine who sat in restraints. It seemed to glide more than walk. Its long robes trailing the ground made a soft brushing noise as it moved forward. No footsteps. The being floated around him languidly taking in the marine. And so the gloating began. So, I see that you are desperate. Desperate to find me. To kill me. You are a marine. Yet you are nothing more than a base assassin. And a poor one at that. Oh, how are the mighty fallen in battle? It leered as it came in closer, moving its face almost to within spitting distance of Storvim. He resisted the urge to hawk and launch his phlegm, but it took effort. I know you are awake, little sycophant of the corpse god. End the pretense. With that, Storvim permitted himself a flutter of a wry smile as he then opened his eyes, straightened in his chair, and glared at the being. His eyes were indeed bruised to the level where only one opened sufficiently for him to see properly to hold its glare. The windows of the soul, some called them, and in the eyes of his enemy, this patriarch of the Chaos Lords, he could see nothing but swirling fires and hate and pain. So much for the vaunted prowess of the Deptus Astartes, the corpse god's own angels of death. How easily you were found. How easily you were subdued by my adherents. Pathetic. Storvim Gardas now opened his mouth for the first time. You made it impossible to find you in the midst of all these millions of huddled scum. Indeed, your forays into the camp have proven weak. I always just slip away while my followers cover my exit. Do you think that there is even one person in this great congregation that will turn me over to you? No, we gave up on that idea a long time ago. Yes, we see that. And you cannot kill us all. Not nearly enough of you for that, is there? Not nearly enough. And I now fear that perhaps our mighty throng should rise up. Should take the fight to your kind, skulking on the periphery of our movement, our camp. Like a hungry dog waiting for scraps, you are beaten. Before we even rise up, you, the legendary space marines, are as nothing compared to our host. You are already beaten. Storvim took in his opponent, the lord at the centre of this ocean of heretics and scum, and a glint appeared in his eyes as he responded. Not quite. You see, we can crush you at any time we like, but we wanted to make sure that you were dead. The rest we can get to in our own time. Even utilise the PDF and the guard. For we, Iron Hands, are here merely to kill you. A quest you have singularly failed in. So, Marine, what is the next move? What have your masters planned if you fail? You will tell me. Oh, you will tell me. At this, coronas of nauseatingly clashing colours and hues erupted from the being's eyes and hands as he now stalked towards the seemingly helpless marine. In fact, by the time I am finished, you will beg to tell me. No need. I will tell you right now. Command! The flesh is weak! What? At this, the helm in the corner crackled and a response came through its vox. Affirmative. Firing on your location. Your name will be added to the annals, the rolls of honour. Go to the Emperor's side, brother. The being stepped back in shock and confusion as the distant sounds of missiles sped closer. 
Goodbye, heretic. And at this, the missile struck the area. Huge explosions bloomed around the tent in a perfect circular pattern that worked its way into the center. Within a minute, the entire segment of the camp was flattened and burning. The Lord dead, the snake headless, the Iron Hands then assembled before the camp and slowly marched into their ranks, chainswords roaring and bolters blazing. The Sanguinor I am one of the few, one of the very few. For when it arrives, it is always at the crux point, when the blood is high, the stakes against us. Impossible odds, certain defeat our fate. Then, and only then, will it deign to appear. I remember it so well that night. It is scorched onto my soul, an everlasting afterimage, as if one has stared too deeply into a fire and its light is burnt onto the back of the retinas. I can still see it whenever I close my eyes. I know why, of course, for we made a pact, he and I, a dire and doleful pact. I have told no one not even the chaplaincy. For I fathom it thus, despite being so ardent in the obeisance to every tenant and rule of our chapter, it is not their business. For the chaplains speak with the authority of those who have been anointed. They are the will of the emperor made manifest. But they are mere men, Astartes, angels of death, I, but men. This mandate, it comes from above them. It comes directly from the son of the emperor, from our primarch himself, in the form of his herald. And the presence of the sanguinary guard, those who have arrived so recently to not only represent what is brightest and best in our chapter, to make certain I do not err, but they are here to defend me. For I am now a lord of angels, I, Rubrio Massaro, am the lord of a company of the blood. It is I who these exemplars now guard, ready to lay down their lives for the continuation of mine own. It is a great weight, but more than this, when I catch one out of the corner of my eye, forever lingering around the edges of my command, my presence, it is then that for a mere fleeting second I can feel him can see him again. It is in the reflection of the light from their armor when they passed under the most powerful lumens. It is their grace. He is like them. But the difference is in orders of magnitude. I remember that night. We were beaten, but we refused to lay down and admit it. It was against our most bitter enemies, our adversaries of all. When we see them, when we meet them on the field of battle with Balter and Chainsaw in hand, the red rage rises, the back beckons. They were the sons of Horus, now the Black Legion. Yet in them is the echo of the presence of their sire, just as we are the echo of the Golden Angel. They are his sons, the progeny of he who slew our Lord, our Father. And when we face them, it is few who do not see the shifting lights, the darkening corridors. The horror screamed from the very walls of the vengeful spirit. And it was no different that night. I was a battle line brother then, had always been the receptacle of not only my own rage, but that of my brother too. Yet that night my rage near unmanned me, near killed me. It was always something that kept me going, making me push on, the very soul of my brother leading me on to the greater service of my lord, the angel. He always helped me to control myself, to remember who I was, to know that this rage was a thing that would master me if I were to let it gain control for even a second. And how close I was. Like all of us, teaching on the edge of slipping into the black rage, 
It was when our captain, Porobiel, fell. His head struck off his shoulders by the champion of the Golden Legion. They laughed. They kicked it around the ground. And I cannot describe, I will not describe, what they were doing to his carcass as we all watched on. A growing, feral growl echoed around the square as the rage ripped through us. Some stood from their positions and tore off their helmets, screaming their rage at the sacrilege. I was amongst them. I wished for vengeance, wished for blood. But if we had all charged then as we were, we would have been gunned down with ease. The Black Legion are the greatest of all of the Chaos forces, the traitor Startes. How I hate to admit that, but it is irrefutable. Had we gone forth at them in this state, we would all have perished immediately. But then it happened. A golden light descended from the skies. It did not fall like a lightning bolt. It did not crash into the ground like a meteor, as so many reports have stated before. No. This time, this time, he slowly dropped down in front of us all. The fire from the Black Legion broke on his armor like rain. Nothing penetrated. And his light. It was so dazzling in its intensity. Yet all of us of the blood could view its very center without wincing, without discomfort. He was beautiful. He was dressed in the finest and most ancient of power armor, his wings gloriously floating out from his back in perfect symmetry, as were a father's, the true angel. And it was so hard to discern the difference, for he was hope and glory given form. He was the will of the Emperor and the Angel reborn. The light from his wings, his presence, had bathed us all. It calmed us, brought us back from the very brink. But then it suffused us with purpose, with passion, with grace. We advanced all right, but we did so with alacrity and agility, with full awareness, with the ability to strategize and avoid the worst of the enemy fire. And we hit them as he finally displayed his true power the Sanguinor, its golden aura risen for all to see, then sped towards the Black Legion champion, straight towards his Terminator guard. And he moved so swiftly, with such a pace that few of their Stormbolter shot even hit him. He hit their lines and tore through the tactical Dreadnought armor as if it were paper, his sword in carmine drawing a toll of blood from our foes. His duel with the champion was brutally efficient, yet a spectacle for he toyed with the champion, blocking every strike, pushing him back, but never dealing the death blow until all of their ward band had seen how pathetically outmatched their master was. And with each back step of the champion of evil, with each of his strikes that were contemptuously batted aside, the enemy lost the verve and vim for battle. When his head slid from his shoulders and bounced thrice on the floor to roll to a stop, the last will of the Black Legion broke and they fled. We harried them, and drove them before us, but we could never stop all of them escaping to their dropships. For when I looked across the field of battle, I saw that only I and one other now lived. The Sanguinor had disappeared when the last of the heretics left the surface of the world. I looked down on my brother, the only other to survive, even briefly. He was choking blood when I took his hand in mine and looked into his eyes as they grew cold. As his light departed, another entered, and there I saw him, in the eyes of my departed brother. I saw him, the Sanguinor, its death mask reflecting the perfection of our Lord's face. As if he stood over my shoulder and was a mere reflection, but there was no light on the face of the marine, no light on my hands that held him, just a light in the now dead eyes. And we looked at each other, he and I, the Sanguinor, and I understood, I knew. He inclined his head, for he could see the realization on my face. I knew, and at that point, the image began to fade, the light dimmed. He had saved me today. 
He had come when all was lost. He had saved me. But there would be a cost. For one day, I would repay this bounty. One day, I would repay it in spades. That was then. This is now. And as we approach the planet, our destination, I am forced to ask myself again, as always, will it be here? Is this my last campaign? Will I repay my debt on this abundance tertius?